Hello mind mappers and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over the how of happiness, a new approach to getting the life you want by Sonia Libomirsky. This book is all about making your happiness pie a little bit bigger. Whether you're the type of person that struggles to feel happy, whether you're the naturally happy person, or whether you're just a person interested in how happiness works and some of the assumptions that we might have around happiness, this book is going to be perfect for you. I pulled out a lot of good quotes from this book, and actually, it made it so that this book was a little bit bigger than the mind map could handle. With that, we're going to move directly into the first quote, the how of happiness. All of us want to be happy, even if we don't admit it openly, or we choose to cloak our desires in different words. Whether our dreams are professional success, spiritual fulfillment, a sense of connection, a purpose in our life, or love, and sex, we covet those things because ultimately we believe that they will make us happier. Yet few of us truly appreciate just how much we can improve our happiness or know precisely how to go about doing it. To step back and to consider your deep-seated assumptions about how to become a happier person and whether it's even possible for you, what I hope this book will spur you to do is to understand that becoming happier is realizable, that it's in your power, and that it's one of the most vital and monumentous things that you can do for yourself and for those around you. What I pulled from this quote is that everyone really just wants to be happy. Isn't that true? But the how is sometimes different. First, we need to know that it's actually possible for us to become happy. There's a large portion of our happiness that is directly within our control. It's not at the whims of professional success, spiritual fulfillment, having connection, having a purpose. It's really just within us. It's within our control. Start watching this video knowing that, and knowing that these tips and, and things that we're going to be going over in the video are going to lead you towards a happier life. Next, we need to look at what we're currently trying and where it is and, and what isn't actually working. Most of us have an object in our life that we think that will make us happy when we accomplish it. For example, you might say, I'll be happy when I get this new job. I'll be happy when I make X amount of money a month. I'll be happy when I find that new relationship. And really, I just have one question, and it's a good question that I think Sonia would approve of. How is that working for you? If you're anything like me and a lot of the people that I talk to through the channel, it's probably not working so well. Maybe you've noticed that even when you do accomplish that thing, the happiness is only fleeting. Inside this book, we're going to examine why that is and what you can do about it. Happiness is in our control, but maybe just not in the way that you think. And with that, we're going to get into mind mapping. What the heck is mind mapping and why do I use it and why do I think it's so important? Well, I think that you can get the most out of mind mapping for number one by following along. You can find the process of how I mind map plus all of the free mind map templates down at the link below in the description. Following along will help you learn more, remember better, and apply these books to your life. Our first major point here is the question of why. In sum, across all the domains of life, happiness appears to have numerous positive byproducts that a few of us have taken the time to really understand. In becoming happier, we not only boost experiences of joy, contentment, love, pride, and awe, but we also improve other aspects of our lives. Our energy levels are better. Our immune systems are better. Our engagement with work and the people with other people is better. And our physical and mental health, of course, is better. In becoming happier, we bolster our, as well our feelings of self-confidence and self-esteem, we come to believe that we are worthy human beings deserving of respect. A final and perhaps least appreciated plus is that if we become happier, we benefit not only ourselves, but also our partners, families, communities, and even society at large. Happy people make more happy people. And if you think that being happy isn't really important, I would encourage you to think again. Some entrepreneurs, ones that I deal with through the channel and some that I'm friends with, actively say that I don't want to be happy because if I'm happy, I'm not going to be motivated. First of all, I think this is really just a false assumption that if you're happy, you're unmotivated. More on that later, but I think that's a false assumption getting started. Second, look at all the things that happiness brings us. It increases our energy. 
increases our immune systems, our engagement with our work. Is a little bit of professional success in status worth not being happy? Is being successful in business worth not being happy? Is the goal the amount of money in the bank account, the size of your business, the car in the driveway, or is the goal really happiness? So what if you're trying to be happy, but have given up? Look at all the things that happiness brings us. It might push you to keep trying. It's going to make you more self-confident. It's going to make you have higher self-esteem. It's going to make your relationships better. Why wouldn't you focus on being happy first? Instead of trying to increase your confidence, increase your self-esteem, increase your relationships or make your relationships better in some way, why wouldn't you focus on being happy first? Right? Some people are trying to hack self-confidence, self-esteem relationships, finding tips and tricks to make them better at these particular skills, which might not be bad in the long term. But as we see here, if you're trying to make a serious change in your life, one that's going to not only be long-lasting, but overarching in all different areas, start with happiness. It's going to shortcut the process. Why not build the skill of happiness rather than the build the skill of self-confidence or professional success? And that brings us to pi. Right on the cover, this is a very important point, and I have it highlighted in yellow here for you. In a nutshell, the fountain of happiness can be found in how you behave, what you think, and what goals you set every day of your life. There is no happiness without action. If feelings of passivity and futility overcome you whenever you face up to your happiness, you must know that a genuine and abiding happiness is indeed within your reach, lying within the 40% of the happiness pie chart that is yours to guide. What makes up this 40%? Besides our genes and the situations that we confront, there is one critical thing left, our behavior. Thus, the key to happiness lies not in changing our genetic makeup, which of course is impossible, and not in changing our life circumstances like seeking wealth, attractiveness, or better colleagues, etc., but in our daily intentional activities. With this in mind, our pie chart illustrates that the potential of the 40% that is within our control within our ability to control, the 40% for room to maneuver, for opportunities to increase or decrease or happy, our happiness levels through what we do in our daily lives and, of course, how we think. So really here, the whole point of the book is that happiness all comes down to pie. But, of course, not the delicious food. It's actually a pie chart. And it looks a little bit like this. We've got 50% of happiness, which is a genetic set point. This is coming from our mom and dad. We've got 10% of our happiness that's coming from outside circumstances, which is money, marriage, house, and a big slice of the pie, 40%, which is coming from internal activities, our thoughts, our actions, and our relationships specifically to ourselves. Most of us spend our time focusing feverishly on the 10% slice of the pie, money, status, and material. And this is obvious because that's the other part that we can control. This pie chart really is kind of split into half. One side that we can control, another side that we can't really control. The unfortunate part is, of course, we spend most of our time worrying about the small part of the piece that we can control. Of course, we're, most of us, it's not working out for us very well. Sony points out here that not only is there less bang for our buck in that piece of the pie, but it's actually less likely to lead to long-term happiness. A quick note for me is that I do believe that a base amount in this 10% is an important piece. However, I also believe that when we focus on the 40%, the 10% naturally follows. Any time in my life I've been the happiest, the money usually followed. Unfortunately, once the money followed, I tended to follow it and stopped focusing on my 40%. I'm sure a lot of us can relate. Imagine increasing your happiness by up to 40%, simply by changing your thoughts and your actions. More on the how of this later, but first, let's take some time to reflect. What piece of the pie have you been focusing on lately? How's that working out for you? And are you willing to try something different? That's what we're going to be talking about today. The work is our next big idea. It may be obvious that achieving anything substantial in life learning a profession, mastering a sport, raising a child, 
a good deal of effort is required. Now, but many of us find it difficult to apply the notion of effort to our emotional and mental lives. Without effort, we might get lucky. But like a long forgotten New Year's resolution, the success will be short lived. Consider how much time and commitment many people devote to their physical exercise. Whether it's going to the gym, jogging, kickboxing, or yoga, my research reveals that if you desire greater happiness, you need to go about it in a similar way. In other words, becoming lastingly happier demands making some permanent changes that require effort and commitment every day of your life. That's what we're talking about in the work. Pursuing happiness takes work. But consider that this happiness work may be the most rewarding work that you'll ever do. So really, start this off by thinking, how committed am I to increasing my level of happiness? This whole thing, of course, is going to take work. Doing something different than you have already done. Doing things that sometimes feel hard. Being consistent in your efforts and choosing the right action in the moment. That's why commitment is so important when it comes to happiness. First, we must understand that this is absolutely possible. Increasing our happiness is absolutely possible for us. Second, we must know that, of course, this will take work. We can't get anything in life without putting a little bit of elbow grease into it. Third, we need to commit ourselves to knowing that this is possible and being willing to take the work. So what if that feels scary at the moment? It's totally okay. Try this on for size. Commit to just making the next right action. Don't think too much about the future just yet. Don't think about how happy you're going to be in a year, two years, three years. Just think about how happy you can be in the moment. What's the next right thing? What's the next thing you can do to make yourself a little bit happier today? That way we're going to get some wins underneath our belt and be able to take on more difficult tasks in the future. Our next big idea is the number 12. 12 happiness activities that have been scientifically proven to increase your levels of happiness. This is where we get into the how of happiness, so to speak. These are good activities to strive for. Notice where you're doing well and understand where you can improve. That's really all I have to say about these 12 different activities. Activity number one is expressing gratitude. Activity number two is cultivating optimism. Activity number three is avoiding overthinking and social comparison. Number four is practicing acts of kindness. Number five is nurture your social relationships. Number six is developing strategies for coping. Number seven is learning to forgive. Number eight is increasing your flow experiences. Number nine is savoring life's joys. Number 10 is committing to your goals. Number 11, practicing religion and spirituality. And number 12 is taking care of your body through meditation, physical activity, and acting like a happy person. Now, the rest of the mind map is going to be devoted specifically to going over a few of these that I believe are extremely important, ones that played a big impact in my happiness in my life, and ones that have impacted some of the coaching clients that I work with. The first one is gratitude. People who are consistently grateful have been found to be relatively happier, more energetic, and more hopeful, and to report experiencing more frequent positive emotions. They also tend to be more helpful and empathic, more spiritual and religious, more forgiving, and less materialistic than others who are less predisposed to gratefulness. Furthermore, the more a person is inclined to gratitude, the less likely he or she is to be depressed, anxious, lonely, envious, or neurotic. Now, most of us have probably heard this before. There's, of course, so much great research out there that gratitude makes us happier and a ton of other great things. Some people are naturally inclined to gratitude, those lucky buggers. For others, it can seem difficult to find things to be grateful for. This is where the commitment and effort comes in that we talked about in a previous point. People who aren't naturally grateful can certainly learn how to be. This book talks about people who used a gratitude journal just for 10 weeks. They noted five things each day that they were grateful for, and they were significantly happier than those who didn't. So let's steal this exercise. What are you grateful for in the here and now? 
This is something that I've taken upon myself to write in my journal every day. What are five things that I'm grateful for? An interesting little hack is if you can't find something that you're grateful for, look for the smallest thing. Look for something right near you, a coffee mug, a pair of socks, a t-shirt, and be grateful for all the effort that went into creating that thing to make your life just a little bit easier. It's a good place to start. Our next idea here is barriers. And this is, I think, the second most important point in the entire book. Right after the pie chart analogy, this was the most helpful for me. Write down your barrier thoughts and then consider ways to reinterpret the situation. In the process, ask yourself questions like, what else could this situation or experience mean? Can anything come from it? Anything good come from it? Does it present an opportunity for me? What lessons can I learn and apply to the future? Did I develop any strengths as a result? So those are barrier thoughts, things that you're coming up against when you're coming up against something difficult in your life, a difficult situation at work, a difficult relationship. If you're struggling to build up a habit, these thoughts are bound to come up. So barrier thoughts really are just the negative way that we're interpreting a situation. So what do these look like? I won't be able to because that's not worth trying because there is no way I could do that because. And what do we do about them when we come up against these barrier thoughts? Another quote from the book is, essentially, all optimism strategies involve the exercise of construing the world with a more positive and charitable perspective. In many entail, considering the silver lining in the cloud, identifying the door that opens as a result of the one that is closed. It takes hard work and a great deal of practice to accomplish effectively, but if you can persist at these strategies until they become habitual, the benefits can be immense. Some optimists may be born that way, but scores of optimists are made with practice. Coming back to that practice and commitment again. So what we're talking about really is getting around these barrier thoughts through optimism. Optimism, therefore, is a skill that can be learned via a deliberate practice. Some questions that you can try the next time you're experiencing these negative barrier thoughts. What else could this situation or experience mean? Could anything good come from it? Does it present any opportunities for me? What lessons can I learn and apply to the future? Did I develop any strengths as a result? Essentially, you're trying to find the silver lining in every cloud that you come up to. We were taught this quite a lot as kids, especially in my household. I don't know if it was yours as well, but it really is interesting to see kind of these old wives tales that you might think of finding the silver lining. Um, actually coming through and being a big part of how science says we can really become happy. Our next big idea is about toxic. The combination of rumination and negative mood is toxic. Research shows that people who ruminate while sad or distraught are likely to feel besieged, powerless, self-critical, pessimistic, and generally negatively biased. I have found that truly happy people have the capacity to distract and absorb themselves in activities that divert their energies and attention away from anxious ruminations. This is something that I've noticed quite a lot in my life. And if you ever get caught in negative emotions, you are negative thoughts, you are not alone. The cycle of being upset about something and spending your time consciously or unconsciously ruminating can be extremely painful. Of course, like I said before, it's something that I came up a lot with myself. A ton of coaching clients are or have dealt with it in the past. The painful rumination of things that we did wrong, things that we wish we did, or things that we're just generally upset about. Most people deal with this rumination through negative distancing habits. Drinking, video games, food, work. Note that these things aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves. But when they're used as a way to get away and escape from these negative thoughts, these toxic ruminations, they quickly become compulsive and problematic. So what should we do about these ruminations if we're coming up against them in our life time and time again? For me, it's step number one. Notice and name. What am I feeling? What am I going through? What are these thoughts trying to actually tell me? Step number two is attempt to feel that emotion fully without blocking it for at least 90 seconds. Step number three is have an activity like hiking, petting a dog, or listening to music 
that you can be healthy and help distract you. That's coming directly from Sonia. Really great activities to do when you're feeling that toxic rumination. Our next big idea is about social comparison. Another favorite of mine, uh, at least in a past life, that's for sure. We found that the happiest people take pleasure in other people's successes and show concern in the face of others' failures. A completely different portrait, however, has emerged of a typical unhappy person. Namely, as someone who is deflated rather than delighted about his peers' accomplishments and triumphs, and who is relieved rather than sympathetic in the face of his peers' failures and undoings. You can't be envious and happy at the same point in time. People who pay too much attention to social comparisons find themselves chronically vulnerable, threatened, and insecure. What about in your life? Does other success affect your mental and emotional state? This is part of victim and zero-sum mindset that is so prevalent nowadays, especially with social media. If someone has success on a social media page, and instead of being happy for them, people comment something negative. Don't think just because you don't comment that you're any better, by the way. You might be thinking negative comments and just not leave them. Look at how you react when someone around you has success. Are you truly happy for them? This is a really great exercise. When you see someone with something that you want in life, relationships, a business, or material things, instead of putting them down in your head, cheer them on. Say nice things to and about them. Don't hang around people who bring successful people down and expect you can become successful. I think that's a really good point, is if you're not cheering on the people who are already winning in the games that you want to play, how are you going to get to the level that they're playing at? Moving on to our final point, projects. In 1932, weighed down by the sorrows and agonies of his self-absorbed and aimless clients, an, Australia, an Australian physician summed up his philosophy like this. If you observe a really happy man, you will find him building a boat, writing a symphony, educating his son, growing double dal dalalias, in his garden, and looking for dinosaur eggs in the Gobi Desert. He was right. People who strive for something personally significant, whether it's learning a new craft, changing careers, or raising moral children, are far happier than those who don't have strong dreams or aspirations. Find a happy person, and you will find a project. I want you to think, do I have a project? Do you have a project? Science shows that when we pour our energy into something, it makes us a lot happier. Specifically when we strive for mastery in that domain, leveling up our skills. This pushes us into flow state more often, and that's one of the main determinants of happiness. And I think project is a really good word for this. Something being accomplished over a long period of time. Something that requires skills and attention. And something that doesn't need to be defined by outcome, moment to moment. You might want to build a beautiful boat, but also you're kind of just happy building a boat. You might want beautiful flowers in your garden, but also you're kind of just happy being out in the sun. How about you? What's your practice? This YouTube channel is my practice. This is my project. This is something that I'm doing to help myself with self-mastery and hopefully bring a few of you along the way with me. I want to thank you for making it all the way till the end of the video. This is a very interesting book. I think there's a lot of really great insights in here in the how of happiness. If you're interested in going a little bit deeper into happiness, there's a free coaching link down below. You can apply, and if I think we'd be a good fit, I'll reach out to you. And we can connect on happiness, we can connect on procrastination, productivity, anything that you might be struggling with right now. Thanks for being with me in this video and I hope to see you in the next one.